Okay. <laughs> my, my name is Daryl Barnes, and I want to talk about the special senses. And remember that for my classes, study your highlighted material for your teacher. Do what your teacher wants you to do. This is a specific review for a specific class at a specific school, but I'm glad you're here. Welcome. When we think about the special senses, cranial nerve one is the olfactory nerve. And interestingly enough, there are little olfactory cilia in the top of our noses that have these bipolar, modified bipolar neurons. They move through the ethmoid bone up into the brain case. And there is a bulb, uh, mitral, cells, mitral cells in this bulb help conduct this information to the brain and ultimately to the inferomedial temporal lobe of the brain for smelling interpretation. Interestingly enough, I learned that there is no thalamic synapse of the sm sense of smell as the sense of smell moves to the cortex area. Interesting. <clears throat> the chemical receptors that pick up smell or odors are called chemoreceptors. They pick up chemical odors. The inability to smell is called anosmia. Taste is, re is very articulated, related to sense of smell, as you might know. Taste buds are located on papillae. I specifically wanted to feature foliate papillae. These are kind of interesting because in childhood we have foliate papillae, but apparently these kind of diminish as we get older. Kind of explains why our tastes change. Why is it that we love mac and cheese and then later, much later, the broccoli taste kind of comes into play? The healthy stuff. One, one thing, I want to go back to this olfactory for just a second because something kind of came to me. Apparently, people who smoke, the heat from the cigarettes, maybe some of the tar, can actually inhibit some of the sense of smell. And I have known some people who are heavy smokers that have to eat spicy food just to get the experience. Taste and smell are very important. Some people are called super tasters. They have increased numbers of fungiform papillae, so they can taste sugar even more acutely than others. And what we understand is that these people don't necessarily crave really heavy, heavily sweet things, maybe more mildly sweet things. Taste is picked up by these cranial nerves, facial number seven, glossopharyngeal nine, and vagus 10. I drew this arrow going in this direction to, to say that as I look at the information, the lower numbers are in the front of the mouth and then they progressively get to the higher numbers as we go into the back of the mouth. In other words, facial might be taste near the front, glossopharyngeal middle back, and then vagus is actually all the way back on the epiglottis. Interestingly, sides of the, sides of the back of the mouth, very interesting. Some of our main tastes are sweet, sour, salty, bitter, umami. Umami is a savory flavor. Glutamate is something that we, that we love to give the richness. And I believe that one of the, one of the things in packaging and in selling of foods has been adding a monosodium glutamate over the years. In some people, this can trigger migraines. It does add a yummy flavor to food. And I was kind of having problems because I was trying to make sure I said this in a nice way. I think it is interesting and, and important to make food palatable, but it also is important that it's healthy as well. And uh, this umami flavor is, is very prized. And it's so prized that people put chemicals in the food to, to give that flavor more, uh, more prevalence. Remember that the primary gustatory cortex is in the parietal lobe. When I looked at this on a brain, I actually thought it was temporal because it's just exactly above the temporal lobe in the parietal lobe. When we think about the eyelids, these are called palpebrae. 
There is a conjunctiva, a lining on the inside of the eyelid is called the palpable con conjunctiva and the bulbar conjunctiva goes exactly over the eye itself. There is a lacrimal apparatus in the superior lateral aspect of the <coughs> eye. And interestingly enough, if we cry, the, the tears drain at the caruncle, the medial feature in the eye and go down the nasal lacrimal duct and then drain into the nose under the inferior nasal concha. So it kind of helps you understand that if you're crying or emotional that your nose could start dripping or it might be that you need to blow your nose, which is not very romantic if it's a, an important special event. But sometimes this is an important part of life. Strabismus is called lazy eye. There is a problem with tandem tracking the muscles in the eye. Don't help the muscle, help the eye track properly. There are several layers of the eye that we're going to talk about. There's a fibrous layer, a vascular layer, and a neural layer. The cornea is the clear front part. And some say that this is translucent, which means partially transmitting light. Transparent might be another word that would, that would fit the cornea, possibly. The sclera is the white part of your eye. When we talk about the vascular layer, we talk about the choroid layer. There are blood vessels in this, and it is a dark layer of the eye, and it helps reduce light scatter. Whenever light comes in through the pupil, it can cause blindness, like deer in the headlights. And the choroid layer helps to minimize some of that. <coughs> the ciliary bodies help, or the body helps to tug on suspensory ligaments to change the shape of the lens so that we can focus in the distance or relaxed or up close. The iris is the beautiful part of your eye. The iris is the part of your eye that your loved one looks into and dreams about the future. The eyes are the window to the soul. I've heard that before. The iris is what controls the hole in the middle of the eye called the pupil. And apparently there are the sphincter ability in the, uh, controlling the uh, diameter of the pupil is parasympathetic influence and the dilator ability is sympathetic influence. Learning that cranial nerve three is associated with some of this accommodation ability of the eye. The inner layer of the eye is called the neural layer, and here we're talking about the retina. When light comes in and goes through the lens and focuses on the back of the eye, it's trying to focus on the fovea centralis of the macula, macula lutea. Why is that important? Because that's where most of the cones are located. That's where you get the acute vision. The rods are more peripheral black and white movement, this is what the rods pick up. Remember that as this visual information is moved out of the back of the eye, it goes through the optic nerve, cranial nerve two, there is a blind spot created in the back of the eye uh, because of this optic disc. Remember that rhodopsin is the visual pigment that has to go through some chemical changes for seeing to occur it uh, is composed of the opsin protein and also retinol, which is vitamin A. Let's go back here for just a second. I think I'm moving past this a little bit too quickly. In the eyeball, there is some jelly-like substance in the back part called the vitreous humor. And then in the front part of the eyeball, there is aqueous humor. And if this does not drain properly, it can cause glaucoma. If you or I have emetropia, that is normal vision. I obviously don't have that because I'm wearing glasses. <clears throat> if a person's eyeball is too short, that's called, called being farsighted. And what happens is this, when the light rays come in through the lens, they focus behind the retina. So it requires a convex lens or a converging lens to focus this image properly on the fovea centralis in the back of the eye. If a person has myopia, that is a person with a long eyeball, that is called nearsighted and requires a concave or a diverging lens for correction. In this case, you can see how I drew a candle upright, 
that then as the image is cast into the eye, it's inverted. It's also not in the right place. You're gonna get a blurry image. And so it requires a lens that causes the light to scatter uh, this direction so that we can get proper positioning of the image on the back of the eyeball. If the lens gets cloudy, it can be because of a cataract. There are lots of nice surgeries that can be done. We've seen different techniques that can be done to remove that and put an artificial prosthesis in there for vision. Astigmatism is when there is an irregular cornea or lens I noticed that with my glasses, my left lens distorts the light bank far more than my right lens does. So I'm thinking that this lens, my left lens, is correcting for astigmatism more than my right lens. As light enters the eyeballs, and by the way, your eyeballs are just kind of part of your brain on the outside of your body. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Weird. As the information goes back, the left eyeball will send some information straight back and then we'll crisscross some over through this optic crossing. The information is dropped off in the lateral gen geniculate nucleus in the thalamus and then ultimately the primary visual cortex or of the medial aspect of the occipital lobe is where imagery or vision is interpreted. Now, I wanna make a couple more comments which are kind of interesting. As this visual information tracks back into the brain, there are some information pieces that get dropped off to the pretectal and the superior colliculus areas in the midbrain. Even though the pretectal and superior collicular regions are not part of this main pathway, these are important for visual reflexes in response to bright lights and so forth. Let's talk about the ear for a few minutes and then we'll be about finished with special senses. Interestingly enough, your ear is called the auricle or the penna. That along with the external auditory meatus, external acoustic meatus, external auditory canal, whatever you want to call it, that is the outer ear. To me, interestingly enough, your ear funnels vibration down to your eardrum and then it goes through the ear ossicles over to the oval window. And every time it diminishes the amount of surface area, diminishes surface area, but at the same time amplifies the sound or the vibration. That's another thing that I want to talk about before I get finished with this. Is it not interesting that as humans, some of our prime sensory inputs are just vibrations. When we think about light, we're talking about electromagnetic radiation travels the speed of light, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. When we think about the sense of hearing, we're talking about sound waves. Travels about, they, these travel about 760 miles per hour. So there's kind of a lag. And if you wanna get more information about that, look at another one of my videos uh, counting the seconds between the lightning and the thunder. I believe we learned that it's about, um, you take the total number of seconds between the lightning and the thunder divided by five for miles. If you want to find out how many miles away this system is located or divide by three if you want kilometers. Kind of interesting. We have two different vibrational sens sensory delightful inputs in our lives. So let's talk about the ear, continue with that. <clears throat> Earwax is called cerumen. The, the sound as it moves through the external auditory meatus arrives at the tympanic membrane. From the tympanic membrane, it goes to the malleus, incus, stapes, to the oval window. And then in the inner ear, by the way, this portion is in the middle of the ear, malleus, incus, stapes, oval window is starting to excurse into the inner ear. The sound goes through the scala vestibuli, scala tympani, and then eventually diffuses back, <coughs> eventually diffuses back through the round window in the middle ear. Now, interestingly enough, when the sound goes through this scala vestibuli, scala tympani area, it's going through the cochlea. There is a basilar membrane inside of the cochlea. And what happens is there's a tectorial membrane that sits on top of these hair cells. And as these hair cells are stimulated, then this is the 
cochlear portion, the hearing portion that is then transmitted back through cranial nerve eight, cochlear nerve. From the cochlear nerve, it goes through cochlear nuclei at the medulla oblongata pons junction to the olivary nuclei in the pons, the medial geniculate nucleus in the thalamus, and then ultimately uh, sound is interpreted in the superior temporal lobe. That's where we locate sound, pitch, loudness, and so forth. Remember that we learned earlier that the sense of smell is the only sense that doesn't have a thalamic drop off in the middle. There are a couple of other interesting parts of the inner ear, the vestibule and the semicircular canal, so I want to talk about those for just a little bit. The macula of the utricle and saccule has little rocks and they're embedded in this jello-like gelatinous material so that when you start, uh, stop or start, however you want to look at that, accelerate, this is what helps you get that sensation of acceleration, stopping and starting the vestibule, the vestibular apparatus. The semicircular canals are also in the inner ear and they are loops that do like this. There are some loops that move in this plane, some of them move this plane, and some like this. And basically you've kind of got a gyroscope going on in the middle of your ear. There are little cupula, little paintbrush things, and when the endolymph pushes these over, it gives a person the sense of spinning in one direction or another. Remember this, that, that within the semicircular canals, also within the scale of media, uh, of the cochlea, there is endolymph. There is perilymph in the scale of vestibuli, scale of tympani, and there's also perilymph surrounding these semicircular canals within the bone, the temporal bone, housing this area in, of the inner ear. Another interesting feature is that if you're listening to very loud music, the tensor tympani and the stapedius muscles uh, help to lock down or stabilize these little ear ossicles so that you don't get too much damage, too much vibration. And I think we also understood that even when you start talking yourself, it actually clamps down on these. Uh, it would be kind of a bummer if you spoke so loud that you annoyed yourself. I guess that could happen if these didn't properly work and do their jobs. Another thing that I want to talk about for just a minute is that the middle area is connect, uh, the middle ear area is connected to the throat through the pharyngotympanic tube. Say that out loud, pharyngotympanic tube. Here, we'll, yeah, we'll say it together, pharyngotympanic tube. Say it all together, pharyngotympanic tube. Everybody all at once. Thank you. This is also called the auditory tube or the eustachian tube. Somehow it has been renamed over the years. Another last thing I want to talk about before we get done is that inside of the cochlea there is this basilar membrane. And probably in this drawing right here, this basilar membrane would be moving in this plane and coiling around as it goes. The proximal portion is thinner and more stiff, and this is where we detect high frequency sounds, 20,000 hertz, and then the other end is broader, and this is where we detect lower frequency sounds. In this case, 20, about 20 hertz. Some of us can't hear that well, but that's possible, possible ability there. That concludes our review of the special senses. Keep studying, keep reading, keep, keep at it until you get it right. Keep coming back. This is Old Man Barnes. <laughs>